her. You ask her to take out her tongue and you see it's pale looking. You pull down her eyelid and you find that that is also rather pale looking. Examine her nails and you find that they are very strange spoon shaped or concave nails. You keep your hand next to hers and you find that her hand is also very pale. Then you find that a number of children are accompanying her which means that she is a multi parous woman who has had many babies in the recent past. You examine a picture of a blood sample and what do you find? This is the normal uh, peripheral smear which shows a number of red blood cells but in her case you find fewer red cells than a normal person. And so what is the diagnosis? That she is suffering from anemia, some sort of anemia. Here is another patient. He is a patient who suffers from a tumor, a cancerous tumor inside his colon which is bleeding heavily all the time. And the doctor is showing him uh, the picture of this tumor and thus in his case also you can expect similar findings. So this patient is also suffering from, uh, from anemia. Both these cases are said to be suffering from iron deficiency anemia. So let us study today a little bit about minerals. The major uh, minerals that are major elements found in living matter are the following. In living matter, we find a lot of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, sodium, potassium, chloride, calcium, and magnesium. When we look at the human body, we find that the major part of the human body is made of oxygen, 65% oxygen. Carbon is only 18%. Hydrogen is 10%. And besides these, besides these three major uh, elements found in the human body, we also find nitrogen, calcium, and other minerals in the body. When we compare the elements found in the human body with the elements found in the Earth's crust, what do we find? Uh, so far as oxygen goes in the human body, 65% of the human body is made of oxygen, whereas in the Earth's crust, there is 46% of um, oxygen. And when we look at carbon, however, in the human body, there's much more carbon, nearly 19 or 20% carbon, whereas in the Earth's crust, there is 0.03% carbon. Hydrogen, again, is 0.5% in the human body. In the uh, Earth's crust, it is only less than 0.2%. Nitrogen, however, in the human body is 3.3%. It's very little in the Earth's crust because our proteins contain nitrogen. When it comes to sulfur, again, uh, the human body has 0.3% sulfur. Earth's crust has only 0.3%. When it comes to sodium, we find that there is much more sodium in the Earth's crust than in the human body. Calcium, of course, is also much more in the Earth's crust than it's found in the human body. Magnesium is more in the Earth's crust than in the human body and silicone which forms a lot of the Earth's crust, nearly 28%, is found in very negligible amounts in the human body. So when we look at the human body, we find that the majority, the main element found in the human body is oxygen and then comes carbon, then comes hydrogen and then nitrogen. These four elements make up nearly 96% of our body weight. And then we have smaller amounts of calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, chlorine, magnesium, sulfur, etc. Then we also have certain trace elements in our body. Trace elements means they are present in very minute amounts. And uh, in our diet also, the dietary requirement is, is again very small. Out of these trace elements, we have iron, zinc, copper, cobalt, iodine, fluoride, chromium, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, vanadium, silicon, etc. These trace elements, even though they are required in very small amounts in the diet, yet they are extremely important for the human body. Without iron, our body cannot transport oxygen. If there is a deficiency of iodine, then it leads to that swelling in front of the neck called goiter. So trace elements, then fluorine is another important trace element without which uh, it is found that a lot of caries develop. So in some countries it is added to toothpaste. Today's discussion, however, centers around iron because we are going to discuss iron deficiency anemia. So iron now, we know that it is a trace element, meaning it is required in the diet in very small amounts. But even uh, despite that, 
it is very very essential for the functioning of the human body so our learning objectives for today's lecture are what are the functions of iron in the body what are the dietary sources of iron how much iron should we be consuming every day where is iron found in the body how is iron absorbed from the git how is iron transported stored and then finally eliminated from the body then what are the reasons of iron deficiency how do we investigate a case of iron deficiency what are the symptoms what are the lab investigations etc and finally uh, the last chapter would be iron overload can the body be overloaded with iron and what problems it it can cause first of all let's discuss the sources of iron iron sources in our diet are of two main types animal products and plant products animal products contain iron in the ferrous form divalent cation ferrous form and these are the best sources of iron because they are going to be very well absorbed by our git these are found in liver meat fish eggs etc plant products also contain iron but here the iron is in the ferric form trivalent iron and this is far and this is not so well absorbed by the human body unless it is converted to the ferrous form first in inside the git so this ferric form of iron is found in cereals like wheat corn rice pulses soya beans green leafy vegetables dried fruits fresh fruits potatoes etc so these are the various uh, substances which are rich sources of iron heme iron is found in uh, animal sources poultry fish meat etc and non heme iron is found in plant sources green leafy vegetables then grains etc so these are rich sources of iron animal sources and the plant sources also contain iron but in the ferric form nuts also contain lots of iron but again in the ferric form so uh, people who are suffering from anemia need to eat more animal sources of iron it not only contains iron it also contains vitamin b12 and if they take a vitamin c rich fruit then that helps in converting ferric iron to ferrous iron and then it is going to be much better absorbed so dried fruits nuts between meals they can also be good sources of iron provided that ferric is converted to ferrous total amount of iron in the human body is only 4 grams that's it which is enough to make only one iron meal that's it that's the total amount of iron we have in our entire body how is this 4 grams distributed 2 and 1/2 grams is found in our hemoglobin and the rest 1 gram is found in stores which are present in the body and half a gram is found in the tissues so a uh, 1 gram in stores in the stores iron exists in two forms ferritin iron which is more readily soluble and hemosiderin iron which is less readily soluble in tissues uh, there is half gram of iron most of it is found in the myoglobin of our muscles 0.3 grams is found in myoglobin and the rest of the iron in our body is found in the form of heme enzymes 0.08 grams and non heme containing enzymes which form 0.1 gram so total body iron is 3 to 5 grams 75% of which is in the blood and iron is present in almost all cells of the body in the form of heme enzymes non heme enzymes etc heme containing proteins are hemoglobin myoglobin cytochromes these are of course the enzymes which contain iron cytochrome cytochrome oxidase catalase and the non heme iron containing proteins are transferrin ferritin hemosiderin so the blood contains 14 and a half grams of hemoglobin per 100 ml of blood usually normally and that is a very good source of iron other the other than that 75% uh, of the total iron therefore is in hemoglobin and the rest 5% is in myoglobin 15% is found in the iron stores ferritin so this is uh, the distribution and storage of iron in our body dietary iron we consume nearly 10 gram milligrams of iron daily which reaches uh, from the stomach it reaches our duodenum however the absorption in the duodenum is only 10% so if you consume 10 mg daily in the diet only 1 mg is going to be absorbed is go it goes down enters the plasma pool from the plasma pool it goes to the uh, bone marrow 
nearly 300 milligrams so that uh, it can supply hemoglobin to the RBCs because as we know in the center of the heme molecule there is iron in the ferrous form. Some of it is stored in myoglobin and the rest goes and it gets stored in the liver. And uh, how does it escape from the body? Those dead cells from the gut, from the GIT or from the skin, when they slough off, then they shed about one milligram of iron per day. That is the iron loss. So as you can appreciate, one milligram gets absorbed. The rest of the 11 milligrams are thrown out in the feces. Only one milligram is absorbed in the bloodstream and one milligram is lost from the body through the sh cells which are shed off because we just discussed that every cell contains iron. So iron is lost in the desquamated cells of the GIT, the, the urinary tract, the skin, etc. However, in case of females, menstrual blood that is lost every month, that uh, constitutes a major source of loss of iron from the body. So the enzymes we've discussed contain iron, uh, heme enzymes, non-heme enzymes. Besides that, myoglobin contains iron and the chief part of iron is found in hemoglobin. Then some iron is stored as ferritin. So this is, uh, and one or two milligrams per day are lost. And from the gut also, the amount of absorbed iron is one to two milligrams per day. So as you can uh, appreciate, one milligram per day of iron is absorbed and one milligram of iron per day is lost from the body in a meal. So what happens is that the iron is in an enclosed system. The body is not allowing uh, it to increase or to decrease. It remains in a state of equilibrium. If, except, of course, in females where more iron is lost from the body in every menstrual period. So if you look at the daily iron metabolism, what do we discover? That oral intake is 1 milligram per day. It enters the blood plasma. From the blood plasma, the major amount goes to the bone marrow for the synthesis of the hemoglobin in RBCs. And when the RBCs live out their 120 days life cycle, they enter the reticular endothelial system, liver, spleen, etc. They get... Uh, Hemoglobin is released, the heme is released from hemoglobin and the heme then releases its iron which enters back into the blood plasma. Also, some iron from the plasma enters the tissues to make the to make myoglobin, heme enzymes, non-heme enzymes, etc. And the total amount excreted daily is again one milligram per day. So what we find is that if the dietary intake is 10 to 12 milligram per day, it enters the small intestine, only one milligram is absorbed. The remainder of the 11 milligrams are thrown out in the feces. That one milligram then enters the plasma. From the plasma, it enters the bone marrow to form hemoglobin. And uh, this hemoglobin is then when it is, uh, when the RBCs have lived out their lifespan of 120 days, then it releases back, it enters the reticular endothelial system and releases back the iron back into the plasma. Also, some of the iron from the plasma is entering all the cells to form the myoglobin, heme enzymes, non-heme enzymes. When these cells die, then they get desquamated from the skin GIT urinary tract. One milligram is thus lost every day. But in case of females, you can see that menstrual loss constitutes 20 to 30 milligrams per month. So the daily iron metabolism, as we can see, is that the dietary iron absorption is 1 to 2 milligram per day, entering the plasma. It is uh, held on by the plasma transferrin, goes, goes to the bone marrow for the synthesis of RBCs. When the RBCs die after 120 days, the macrophages in the macrophages, reticular endothelial system, etc., then they release the iron, which enters back the plasma. And some iron also manages to reach the muscles to form myoglobin. Some is stored in the liver, etc. Body iron loss is 1 to 2 milligram in the sloughed mucosal cells, which are desquamated. But other than that, menstrual blood loss is a separate matter. Here you can see the duodenal cells from where the iron is absorbed. This is the part which faces the inside where the food comes down. And uh, the food iron consists of two types of iron, iron in heme and the non-heme iron. The heme iron, which is in ferrous form, immediately enters the uh, intestinal epithelial cell through heme transport. But the ferric iron, which is found in uh, vegetables, uh, it is in the ferric form, so it does not find any doorway to enter. It cannot enter the heme transporter. So what it needs to do is it goes back to near the lining of the epithelial cells, 
and there it meets this reductase enzyme called duodenal cytochrome B, which changes, which reduces ferric iron to ferrous iron. This ferrous iron then enters through the divalent metal transporter, which will only allow divalent metal ions to pass through. So it enters into the intestinal epithelial cell. In the intestinal epithelial cell, therefore, some of this ferrous iron is stored in mucosal ferritin. It changes to ferric and is stored in mucosal ferritin, and some of it goes out into the bloodstream. Most of it goes out in the bloodstream, and it passes through this exit, which is called ferroportin. Once it comes out in the ferrous form, it has immediately got to be changed to the ferric form. So it meets this enzyme hephestin, which changes it back to the ferric form, and this ferric form is then held by the plasma transferrin and it circulates in the blood either going to the erythroid marrow or going to the liver etc. So we have seen how in the enterocyte ferric iron has to be reduced by the reductase enzyme to ferrous then only will it enter the divalent metal transporter and uh, some of it gets uh, stored as ferritin the rest of the ferrous iron leaves the cell through ferroportin Peroxidase enzyme changes the ferrous to ferric and this then gets attached to transferrin and moves on into the plasma cell. It may enter the macrophage, etc. So this is the iron metabolism. Ferric iron enters the enterocyte only after changing into ferrous. And then ferrous iron, when it leaves the intestinal epithelial cell, it has to be changed back to ferric so that it can be transported along with plasma transferrin. So we've already discussed this. Absorption of iron is under feedback control and it depends upon the amount of stored iron in the body. If the amount of stored iron in the body is less as in pregnancy or in iron deficiency, then more iron is going to be absorbed more than 10%. We have just discussed that out of the 10 milligram taken in the diet, only 1 milligram is absorbed, that is 10%. However, in, in pregnant women or in patients suffering from iron deficiency anemia, more than 10% is going to be absorbed from the diet. Similarly, activity of the bone marrow. More iron is going to be absorbed from the diet, more than 10% if hemolysis is going on and the need of the body has increased for iron. Even in non-iron deficiency anemia, the body conceives it as a sort of need for more iron to be absorbed, so absorption is more. Giving vitamin B12 in pernicious anemia also causes an increase in the absorption of iron uh, from the diet. When oxygen tension in the intestinal cells is low, as in hypoxia, again the body feels that there is an, an increased need for more iron absorption, so iron absorption from the GIT increases. Different factors affect the amount of iron that is going to be absorbed from the diet. We've discussed the form of iron. More ferrous form of iron is absorbed than ferric form. Then uh, insoluble complexes of iron. Phytates, phosphates, oxalates, carbonates, proteins, etc. All these catch hold of the iron in the diet and prevent it from being absorbed. And these are found in lentils, beans, in all kinds of fibers that we consume in the diet. So these catch hold of the iron in the diet and prevent it from being absorbed by forming insoluble complexes of iron. So if there's an excess of phytates, phosphates, oxalates, etc. in the diet or carbonates, it is going to prevent iron from being absorbed. Promoters of iron absorption, vitamin C. If a little bit of lemon juice is squeezed on food, then it helps to convert ferric iron to ferrous iron and thus absorption is increased. Citric acid it also increases absorption. A little bit of amine, animal food or amines or sugars also help in absorption of iron. In the people who consume alcohol, absorption of iron is reduced. Also, it, alcohol can lead to bleeding ulcers, which again uh, reduces the absorption of iron. Tea. Tea contains polyphenols in tannin, tea and coffee both. And these again form insoluble complexes of iron and prevent the iron from being absorbed. So tea should never be drunk along with meals because it is going to reduce iron absorption. Whatever iron that is present in the diet is not going to be absorbed. Gastric hydrochloric acid increases iron absorption. So people suffering from achlorhydria, there the iron absorption will be reduced. Malabsorption, of course, general malabsorption in the intestine will prevent iron absorption also. In acute fevers or chronic infections, again, iron absorption is reduced. 
So uh, iron absorption is increased by acidic pH of the stomach, ascorbic acid or any other form of acid that is consumed with food like vinegar, citric acid. Cysteines reduce ferric iron to ferrous uh, iron and hence they increase iron absorption. Iron absorption is inhibited by excess phosphates, phytates or oxalates in the diet. Milk antacids also reduce uh, the absorption of iron. Tetracycline uh, antibiotic reduces iron absorption by again forming insoluble complexes. So we have discussed the factors which increase iron absorption because iron is mainly absorbed in the ferrous form. So ascorbic acid and cysteine increase the absorption because they favor the reduction of ferric iron to ferrous iron. Vitamin C and hydrochloric also favor the reduction of ferric iron to ferrous iron. In iron deficiency state, iron absorption is increased much more. It may be increased to 2 to 10 times that of normal. These are the weeks of pregnancy of a pregnant woman and as we can see the iron requirement because the fetus is developing tissues etc, placenta is developing etc. So the iron requirement for these tissues goes on increasing uh, as the weeks uh, in, uh, of the pregnancy go on increasing. Iron absorption is also increasing concomitantly, however it cannot keep pace with the iron requirement and thus there is always iron deficit. And so we know that pregnant women are prescribed iron tablets, uh, ferrous sulfate tablets in the latter parts of their pregnancy. So what we find the factors affecting uh, non-heme iron absorption is that taking vitamin C containing fruits will increase the absorption of iron like tomatoes, cauliflower, etc. And what factors inhibit absorption? Tannins in tea, dietary fiber, phytates in whole grain, polyphenols, oxalates, etc. reduce the absorption of iron. So which factors decrease iron absorption? Phytates and phosphates in food, achlorhydria, deficiency of hydrochloric acid because in this case ferric iron cannot be changed to ferrous iron. Also in the presence of gastrointestinal diseases, iron absorption is reduced. So we see here that phytates, tannins, antacids, etc., they prevent the absorption of iron because they do not allow ferric iron to be changed to ferrous iron and they form insoluble complexes of iron. So these factors increase iron absorption, gastric hydrochloric acid, heme iron, of course, is very well absorbed, high body demand for RBCs like blood loss or being at a high altitude or uh, pregnancy etc so these increase uh, iron absorption if the body stores of iron are low then of course there is increased absorption meat protein factor vitamin c intake all these vitamin c changes ferric form of iron to ferrous form of iron so all these increase iron absorption decreased iron absorption when the diet contains a lot of fiber meaning phytic acid oxalic acid present in leafy vegetables polyphenols present in tea coffee etc then if the body stores of iron are high, this will prevent iron absorption, excessive intake of other minerals like zinc, manganese, etc. because they will compete uh, for absorption of iron, reduce gastric acid or calcium containing supplements and antacids, these all reduce iron absorption. Transport of iron is, in the, is along with the protein in the iron called transferrin. 3 to 4 grams per liter of transferrin are present normally in the blood. Total iron binding capacity, despite the fact that plasma iron in the blood is 0.8 to 1.6 milligrams per liter and transferrin protein in the plasma is 3 to 4 grams per liter. So this transferrin is saturated, after it is saturated with iron, so much of it is still left uh, blank, it is still left empty. So the total iron binding capacity, meaning it has the capacity to bind more iron, that is 3 to 5 milligram per liter. In case of a low level of iron, iron deficiency, this total iron binding capacity is going to increase because more of the transferrin will remain vacant, more of the transferrin will remain empty, devoid of iron because of a deficiency of iron. So TIBC will increase in case of uh, iron deficiency. The form in which iron is stored in the body is ferritin which is the soluble form of iron and hemosiderin which is the insoluble form of iron. Iron is usually stored in the liver, spleen and bone marrow but a tiny bit is stored in all cells of the body and also uh, a little bit is circulating in the blood plasma. So we see that the erythrocytes they contain the maximum amount of iron, plasma has 4 milligram of uh, iron. 
per liter and the body stores are contain 1000 milligram myoglobin and respiratory enzymes have 300 milligrams daily elimination of iron in the feces nearly 90 percent of the dietary iron is thrown out in the feces why because it's not absorbed only 10 percent is absorbed in the urine we find a 0.1 milligram daily and this is because it is present in the desquamated epithelial cells some wbc's rbc's which may be thrown out in the urine Sweat contains desquamated skin cells, so uh, 0.1 milligram per day is of iron is found in the sweat. Menstrual blood, however, contains 20 to 30 milligrams of iron being thrown out every month. And in pregnancy, 400 milligrams of iron are required per pregnancy. So as you can see, a normal male will require only the replenishment of 1 milligram per day that is being thrown out normally, that is being thrown out normally by the body. But for a woman, for a woman, you find that in the normal reproductive age of a woman, she requires this much more iron to be taken every month. And a pregnant woman needs this much more iron to be taken in her pregnancy. And hence, the daily requirement, recommended daily intake of iron for children up to puberty, for men and for postmenopausal women is 10 milligrams because out of this 10 percent is going to be absorbed that is one milligram daily and that is sufficient for these three categories however for adolescents because their body is growing and their tissues are growing so they need more iron so their daily requirement is 10 to 20 milligrams women during reproductive life need to take an extra 20 milligrams daily during pregnancy women need to take an extra 30 milligrams daily which cannot be met as we have seen by the regular diet and hence they need to take iron uh, in the latter part of the pregnancy. So as we can see out here, infants, children, etc., here males, etc., they require 10 to 12 milligrams per day. That's enough for them. But in case of females, adolescent females, as soon as their menstrual period starts, you find that their requirement is increased much more than the males. And in adults, in case of women, for males it remains constant, nearly 10 to 12 milligrams constant throughout their lives. But in females, you find that um, when they become adults, they are getting their regular menstrual periods every month, so they need more iron per day. And uh, after uh, uh, menopause, the, again their iron requirement becomes the same as that for the males. But during pregnancy, they require much more iron intake daily. The recommended daily intake in Pakistan, uh, people are consuming less than 70% of the recommended daily allowance. And this is especially true in the following segments of society. Pregnant and lactating women, they are taking 70% less than, sorry, 70, only 70% 70 of the recommended allowance. Non-pregnant adult women, they are also taking much less than the recommended allowance. Children less than five year olds, they are also taking less. And also they have inherited iron deficiency from their mothers who if they have uh, iron deficiency anemia because of malnutrition, then their children are also born with depleted iron stores. So children less than five years old, we do find a lot of iron deficiency in these all these three categories of patients. What are the functions of iron? Number one, the carriage of oxygen in the form of heme. In, this is a protoporphyrin ring and we see in the center iron. And uh, the, these uh, porphyrin rings are found in all the four, in the middle of all the four globin chains of hemoglobin. And inside this, in the center of each of these hemes, we find iron. So this is the iron sitting in the center of the ring, porphyrin ring, and we find that oxygen attaches to this iron. So the job of iron is to transport oxygen from the lungs to all the tissues of the body. Second important function of oxygen, of iron, is that it is essential for redox reactions. Redox reactions means reduction oxidation reactions. How does this happen? Ferric iron is continuously changing into ferrous and ferrous is changing into ferric. Ferrous takes an electron and becomes ferrous. This is called a reduction reaction. And ferrous loses an electron and becomes ferric. And this is called oxidation reaction. And these are continuously happening inside the body. Oxidations are uh, a part of intermediary metabolism. And reductions are used in the synthesis of larger molecules in the body. Redox reactions are found going on in cytochromes 
in the respiratory chain, cytochrome B, C1, CC, AA3. These are all found in the electron transport chain. What are cytochromes? They are proteins containing heme as a cofactor, and iron is found in the heme core. Function of the cytochrome, cytochromes is reversible redox uh, reactions, meaning ferrous is changing into ferric, and again ferric is changing back to ferrous. This is how they are transporting electrons throughout the electron transport chain. Then we have cytochrome P450. Cytochrome P450 are also heme proteins. They contain heme as a cofactor, and they are the terminal oxidase enzymes in electron transfer chains. They use a variety of molecules as substrates in enzymatic reactions. Then we have cytochrome B5. These are ubiquitous electron transport heme proteins. They are found in animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, etc. Then besides the cytochromes, we also have heme enzymes like tryptophan pyrolase, which converts tryptophan to formylkinuranine, peroxidase, which uh, changes hydrogen peroxide to water, catalase, which again changes two molecules of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. All these are heme-containing enzymes, and in the center of the heme molecule is present iron in the ferrous form. Then we also have non-heme iron containing enzymes where iron is present but not inside heme, NADH dehydrogenase, succinate dehydrogenase, aconitase, xanthine oxidase, monoamine oxidase, all these are enzymes which contain iron as a cofactor but they do not contain heme. How do we investigate a patient for iron deficiency? Uh, plasma iron normally is 0.8 to 1.6 milligrams per liter in the blood. TIBC is normally 3 to 5 milligrams per liter. Transferrin is normally 3 to 4 grams per liter. Ferritin is more, usually more than or equal to 10 nanograms per ml. Free erythrocyte protoporphyrin is less than or equal to 10 microgram per dl. Hemoglobin in men is usually no, more than or equal to 13 grams per dl. In women, more than or equal to 12 grams per dl. And pregnant women and children less than 6 year old, more than or equal to 11 gram per dl. Then there are erythrocyte indices, mean corpuscular hemoglobin, mean corpuscular volume, mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration, etc. And finally, we can perform biopsy of the bone marrow, liver, spleen, and stain with potassium ferricyanide. So these are the different investigations, and these are their normal values which are done when we are investigating a case of iron deficiency anemia. Uh, one thing to note is there is a paradox. As the, this is a normal picture of serum transferrin, the amount of serum transferrin found in the plasma and also TIBC, and serum iron and serum ferritin. This is the normal scenario in the blood. In case of iron deficiency, of course, the first thing to reduce are the stores. Serum ferritin becomes so low. Second thing to reduce is serum iron. And what about serum transferrin? Serum transferrin, on the contrary, it is a paradox, but it becomes higher than normal. And when we look at the total iron binding capacity, of course, this also becomes very high. Because if you remember, what is total iron binding capacity? Meaning the capacity of the transferrin to bind iron. Now, if normally it is binding this much iron, in iron deficiency, there's only this much iron to bind. So the empty part of transferrin, which is capable of binding iron, becomes much more. So in iron deficiency anemia, paradoxically, TIBC becomes more. It rises in iron deficiency anemia. What are the causes of iron deficiency? Either the need is, has become more, like in adolescents, uh, women who are menstruating uh, monthly, pregnant women, lactation, or people with cancer who are losing blood from the uh, cancerous tumor, or insufficient intake, like limited diet or malnutrition or a vegan diet, or decreased absorption. Decreased absorption can happen when there is vitamin C deficiency, or removal of the upper small intestine, or high body stores of iron or excess iron complexes or achlorhydria. In Pakistan, the major causes of iron deficiency are heavy menses, repeated pregnancies, hookworm infestation, late weaning of babies, inadequate intake of uh, or dietary intake due to poverty, excess of phytates, carbonates, oxalates, phosphates, phosphates or polyphenols in the diet, meaning excess of tea, excess of fiber in vegetable products taken in the diet, malabsorption, increased requirement, achlorhydria, partial gastrectomy, chronic infections, hemorrhages, all these are causes of iron deficiency in Pakistan. 
what are the stages of iron deficiency so uh, the first stage is that the ferritin stores become low second stage the tibc is increased total iron binding capacity third stage we find microcytic hypochromic anemia that is hemoglobin level becomes lower than normal mean corpuscular volume becomes less than normal because of a lack of hemoglobin inside the rbc mean corpuscular hemoglobin becomes less than normal a lack of hemoglobin inside the rbc mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration becomes less than normal because of a lack of heme synthesis so this is a normal picture of uh, anemic patient versus the normal pe peripheral smear of a norm patient with normal blood so in iron deficiency anemia we find that the mean corpuscular volume is reduced mean corpuscular hemoglobin is reduced mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration is normal to reduce iron is reduced tibc is in total iron binding capacity is increased transferrin saturation is reduced ferritin stores are reduced then we find a uh, red blood cell distribution width this is high because uh, some rbcs are very small some are bigger so that distribution increases to more than normal reticulocytes may be normal or low platelets may be normal or low or even high wbcs are normal or low peripheral smear shows hypochromia meaning the rbcs are paler in color anisocytosis meaning the there is the shape may be different microcytosis meaning the cells may be smaller than normal and poikilocytosis all kinds of teardrop shaped and sickle shaped and all kinds of strange shapes of the rbcs what are the signs and symptoms of iron deficiency reversible alteration of cognitive behavior in children if there is iron deficiency we find that it's not only their motor functions that uh, suffer but also their mental status function suffers decreased attention span and alertness impaired motor development decrease physical activity fatigue irritability anorexia abnormalities in thermoregulation low scholastic achievements low immunological and defensive responses so they keep falling sick more often and then are then uh, of course as if, as they keep falling sick more often so there are uh, anemia goes on increasing even more so the signs and symptoms of iron deficiency anemia in adults are as follows they feel uh, easy fatigability headaches tachycardia heart is beating more because of again uh, anemia severe anemia ankle edema uh, the ankle seem very um, swollen and if you press them then there a pit may be formed exertional dyspnea when they climb stairs they become breathless inelastic dry wrinkled skin sore atrophic tongue angular stomatitis meaning the angles of the mouth they uh, show fissures pallor they look very pale pica they they want to eat strange things polynychia means that the nails become spoon shaped or concave dysphagia meaning swallowing becomes difficult menstrual abnormalities dry scanty hair pearly white sclera functional systolic murmur gastric mucosal atrophy so these were all the signs and symptoms of iron deficiency now let us look at the other side of the picture meaning what is iron overload this is the other end of the spectrum it could be iron poisoning like acute iron poisoning a child suddenly opens a bottle of his mother's ferrous sulfate tablets for pregnancy and he eats them all up or hemochromatosis which is a genetic condition of iron overload or nutritional iron overload siderosis or iron overload which is non iron deficiency anemia this is the picture of liver microscopic appearance of hemochromatosis where the liver is loaded with iron when the liver is load when the body is loaded with iron that iron can be found deposited in the pituitary gland thyroid heart pancreas adrenal gland liver meaning all the organs of the body may become saturated with iron when there is iron overload so what is iron overload iron overload is a disease which is clinically known as hereditary hemochromatosis or bronze diabetes in which the body absorbs more iron from the gut than it loses meaning uh, we know that 1 mg is absorbed and 1 mg is lost so the iron is in an enclosed space it is in an enclosed equilibrium but if the body starts absorbing more iron than normal then it is losing then of course what's going to happen that that iron excess iron is going to get stored in the body causing the mineral to accumulate in specific areas of the body causing damage to various organs it the cause commonly is a genetic disorder called hereditary hemochromatosis sometimes it can be acquired 
how by numerous blood transfusions as are given to children suffering from thalassemia or excessive iron injections in pregnancy or high level of iron supplements so this is a secondary acquired cause so we have primary hemochromatosis which is hereditary hemochromatosis which is an autosomal recessive condition and because this and the cause of this is a mutation in the hfe gene secondary hemochromatosis therefore on the other hand is due to an acquired causes of iron overload iron loading anemias with transfusions like in thalassemia major sideroblastic anemia excessive dietary ingestion etc or alcoholic liver disease symptoms of hemochromatosis in the early stage there is fatigue joint pain abdominal pain loss of libido late stages arthritis liver disease diabetes heart abnormalities skin discoloration and organ failure so we find that in the initial stages there may be no symptoms of iron overload and then it can in the second stage it can lead to fatigue weakness weight loss abdominal pain pain in the joints in the latter stage it can lead to arthritis amenorrhea early menopause loss of libido impotence dyspnea and in the last stages it can lead to arthritis abnormal liver function diabetes chronic abdominal pain severe fatigue hypopituitarism hypogonadism cardiomyopathy arrhythmia cirrhosis of the liver liver cancer heart failure and bronze colored pigmentation of the skin so these are the various stages that develop with time in a patient who has an excessive amount of iron accumulation in his body skin of the patient becomes bronze the there is iron deposition in the epidermis of the exposed parts of his body liver of this patient or bronze diabetes is looks almost blackish because it is so overloaded with iron and in the skin also the epidermis iron levels vary over a wide range so a lot of iron can be seen in the sun exposed regions which have a higher level of free iron so the investigations for hemochromatosis are fasting transference saturation needs to be first found out how much is being stored if the transference saturation is raised then ferritin stores need to be found out if it has already started being stored 